Okay, this talk comes from Jonathan Talks. Thank you. He says, uh, Jimmy, Provi Dentissimus Deus, uh, in that Pope Leo the Thirteenth says we must hold to the consensus of the fathers on Scripture. What is your response? Have you read Father Rippinger's response, Rippinger's response to your claims about tradition? I've looked at Father Rippinger's response, but it's been a while, and I I uh, I recognize that there is a role for the consensus of the fathers, but. The idea that it's a fourth organ of infallibility is mistaken. I mean, we have the Pope, we have the bishops meeting in council, we have the bishops meeting outside of the council, and the idea that the church fathers, some of whom weren't even bishops, could have a a fourth exercise of the charism of infallibility is not the teaching of the church, and it's it's making way too much out of a out of an unambiguously disciplinary decree that was just regulating the per, the boundaries of public debate and writing. Gideon? Yeah, I would say that I don't think this is a fourth organ of infallibility. I think this is one of the many modes in which tradition itself can be authoritative. I think if Jimmy's position were correct, Tradition in itself could never be authoritative unless the magisterium explicitly said that this particular aspect of the tradition is infallible or this particular um, set of fathers saying this makes this more probable. I think it's simply the case that when we look at the church fathers, um, not every little detail of where they discuss tradition has been defined by the magisterium. Um, and so as a result, I simply don't think that this works. Just like Jimmy was pointing out, right, we can have the infallibility of the magisterium through the Pope talking, through the bishops meeting in council, the bishops meeting outside of council. Likewise, the tradition can be authoritative through something being taught over the centuries, through all the fathers teaching something, through all the scholastics teaching us something. And I would say that there's many different ways in which tradition is authoritative. And if you just go read the scholastics, go open up the Summa or the Ordinatio or St. Bonaventure's Sentences commentary, you will not primarily see them citing the magisterium. You're going to primarily see them citing the church fathers and making arguments from the church fathers. And it seems that, and the same with the manualists as well, they primarily argue from the church fathers. And so it seems this, and also the scripture as well, this seems to be the normative way in which theology was done up until about a century ago. And so it seems to me this is the normative way theology should be done. I I do want to ask a question about this. And I'll let you respond, Jimmy. The Mm -hmm. magisterium then gets to weigh in on the correct theological opinions and the correct interpretation of Scripture and tradition. And on this question, they've done that. So, so just real quick, this is this is my question because it seems like we keep yeah. coming back to this. Where, where are we kind of putting our emphasis on the fathers or the magisterium? In other words, are we just sort of are we essentially like Protestants, but we're like sola scriptura plus the fathers, and then the magisterium? What you know, like who has the final mm-hmm. say? I guess is what I'm asking. Yeah. I'll let Jimmy answer first, and then Gideon just to sort of expand yeah. this thought. Well, scripture speaks. Scripture and tradition speak first because they come to us from God, and then theologians and fathers and ordinary lay people read scripture and tradition, both of which are authoritative. But there's a question of which scriptures are authoritative, because the Gnostics wrote a bunch of them, and there are questions of which traditions are authoritative and which aren't. And the one that ultimately rules on the question of which scriptures are authoritative and which traditions are authoritative is the magisterium. That's its function, to teach us from these two sources. And so when the magisterium weighs in on a question, even non-infallibly, we need to take it very seriously. And the magisterium has weighed in on this question do, do the sources of Scripture require a young earth and a rejection of evolution? And the magisterium has said, no, they don't. And they've said that repeatedly in multiple formats, and they've spoken endorsingly and appreciatively of mainstream science. So I think that ordinary lay people need to take both of those facts very heavily in, in, in weight and be very cautious about rejecting the rulings of the magisterium over the last hundred years on this question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would say the magisterium has seemed to primarily leave this question open because they have not condemned a young earth position as contrary to the church fathers. Now, the magisterium has explicitly ruled that an old earth position is an acceptable theological opinion among Catholics. And according to the personal opinion of many in the magisterium, they seem to think it is the more probable one. So I will fully hold that no Catholic should be saying someone is a heretic for saying they hold to an old earth. No one should be saying that they cannot be Catholic and do that. What I am saying is that we have to take, when, once the magisterium has left this question open, we then have to look at what the church fathers do actually say in this matter. Um, and it seems that this was somewhat what came up in the Jansenist controversy, where the Jansenists were appealing to lots of church fathers. And the magisterium, and the main argument against the Jansenists was the magisterium says otherwise. And it does seem to me that some of the details of the exact relationship between the magisterium and tradition were never fully worked out in the Jansenist controversy. A lot of them were raised in important questions, but they haven't fully been settled. And I think absolutely a future ecumenical council should probably take up and discuss and more precisely define the relationship of the two. But until that's done, I will simply follow follow the scholastics and the manualists of how they did theology and how they weighed the different sources. And it seemed to me that the weight on which they put on the consensus of the fathers on issues where there's a lot less consensus, because this is a higher consensus than things like infant baptism, uh, than things like the Trinity. This is probably the highest consensus I've ever encountered among the church fathers on a matter. Um, and we take those as authoritative. And so it seems to me that this should be, have at least, at the very least, I think people should acknowledge the very serious weight that the absolute, complete, unanimous consent of the fathers on the literal interpretation of the chronology of scripture is very, very important. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment below letting us know what you thought about the video.